today's episode of Hashtag Heroes, we speak to Andreas de Stack. When I say speak, I mean we are entertained by this man. He is a performer, he's an actor, he's a presenter, he's a creative arts embodied. I really think you'll enjoy this episode. He tells us a story of growing up in the West of Ireland, combating ADHD, combating alcoholism, and how he's thrived as a successful creative in the industry right now. I hope you enjoy. I was born on the, the Tomb, Tomb Road in Galway Town, and um, it was a different Galway that time, you know. Uh, uh, it was a small city, boy, like 30 or 40,000 people. And um, I were on the Tomb Road, we went to national school in the Gaeltacht there, in Gael, what's called Gaeltacht the Knocker. It would be the north side of the city, wouldn't be Connemara, no, there's not many people know there's another wee Gaeltacht on the, the north side of Co- County Galway which was pretty strong back in the 80s. You know, after Galway won the hurling in 1980, the famous speech, so that was kind of Castle Gar Club and that. And um, then uh, when I was nine years old, then my parents separated. My dad went to San Francisco and I moved to Mayo with my mother's family. And I kind of became a Mayo man then, you know, and I wanted to fit in out the country, you know, and I became kind of a sheepdog for a while. I loved running after sheep and I loved the farm and, and really got into that. But... Um, was I was getting into trouble from a young age, you know, like I had, um, <clears throat> you know, I was hyperactive and stuff. I, I didn't know that time that, that I was, you know, about sugar making me high or whatever. I was just, and I suppose they didn't have the term ADHD either in those days. You were just bowled. So I was getting, starting to get, in, by the time I went to secondary school, I was getting in trouble in school. And I got thrown out of school in Hetford then, which was the nearby school. Um, that'd be up on the Mayo Galway border. And then I ended up, to my leaving search in Tune. And um, it was kind of exciting times, really, if you think of like the, the early 90s in the West. You know, you had the Saw Doctors come out of Tune, the Stunning were in Galway. There was a band of Christie's called the Big Geraniums. They were living out in Shrule, out, out where I'm from. And there was um, the Water Boys that just left Spittle. So there was kind of a, just show you, there was kind of a raggle taggle kind of a buzz. It was kind of like. <laughs> So there was this kind of thing. So when I started to take up the, the fiddle, well, I'd been playing guitar, you know, and we'd I'd been up to see Nirvana in Dublin in 93. But by the time it came to 94, um, even though a lot of the hippie, dippy, gypsy stuff was moved out of Galway at that point, I, I took up the fiddle. Um, my father was producing the Celtic Arts Festival in San Francisco. So I started to hear real Irish music, you know. And, you know, Irish music is that kind of music. Like this was pre-digital, pre-Riverdance, pre-internet. There hadn't been a <clears throat> big, you know, a the tiger explosion of kind of arrogance in terms of Irish culture. There was very much the underdog. You know, we'd come from the 80s, which had seen the hunger strikes, you know, the recession in Ireland. And Irish music was a kind of a suddenly this this voice of people, you know, Christy Moore, Sharon Shannon, the Water Boys. And it was kind of, it had a kind of its own kind of lazy hippie gypsy kind of feel to it. Like, um, <clears throat> then I ended up in college in Sligo and I was big into playing the fiddle at that time. There was a great music scene in Sligo. You know, the bands like Dervish were playing around the town. There was great music scene in Sligo. I still think Sligo, you know, it's one of the best music scenes in the world and getting stronger all the time. So, um, yeah, I ended up traveling after that then and playing music for a while. But it wasn't until um, 2006 when I gave up the drink that I stopped kind of working in Irish pubs and I kind of more... um, I, I found then I wasn't able to write down my stories I came back and I found I was, when I put my stories with music, I was kind of channeling something and finding something that made sense to me because there had been so much music that I grew up with, but also my father was a writer and a storyteller and I wasn't able to sit down and write stories. I, I still struggle a lot with that, with, with the computers, but um, I was able to tell stories. So that's kind of how I became a storyteller and the music has always been central to the stories I'd be telling. What I'm kind of interested in the moment is the way, um, you know, like uh, as Irish people, we're famous for storytelling and we're all storytellers. And especially, you know, you could argue that in the arts, whether it's visual art, film, TV, theatre, it's all part of storytelling, you know. And you see the strong Irish storytelling, both in, say, our, our stand up comics, like whoever, Tommy Tiernan or Billy Connolly, who's, you know, Scottish Irish, or you see, um, 
the theatre from from Martin McDonough to all the great theatre you see, it's you know there's uh, you know Irish theatre has its own special voice. But I suppose when I take it back to actual storytelling, like actually somebody actually just telling a story orally, I'm particularly interested in um, some of the Irish language stories that were collected in Mayo and Clare. But some of them, like storytellers that time, you know, years ago, you'd go to someone's house to hear a story and you'd have to come back the following night to hear the second half of it. You know, stories would be, could be 14 hours long. You know, sometimes a storyteller could tell a story for a week because he might be getting free lodgings somewhere and he would have to stretch out the story, you know. But um, what I'm kind of interested in is bringing the music into the stories because, you know, how in Dublin in recent years, there's been a um, spoken word has been popular and... You could argue that a lot of spoken word, it takes its kind of rhythms uh, a lot of the time from, um, say, spoken word in the UK and the US, it takes its rhythms from hip hop and 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 that kind of, sp- and rap spoken word. Whereas in rural Ireland, the, the storytelling, we're kind of looking that there was, and there still is elements of Irish music in there. So like Jig and Reel and Polka. So when I'm performing stuff with the lads, we're kind of like, We'd say um, a jig is one to three, one to three, one to three, one. Dee 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 dee. So it could be he mightn't, he wouldn't, he couldn't, he shouldn't, he kicking the ball up in the air. He mightn't, he wouldn't, he couldn't, he shouldn't, he scratching his arse and scratching his. Arse. So I find the jigs maybe sometimes in music in the story, or other times I might find the polka. You know, um, so like, so a normal polka is like like a carry polka, but but sometimes from the traveling, we might play like a gypsy polka or a gypsy 2-4, like. You know, so we'll find that kind of on that, on that, on that. Like, like what you'd hear in Cork and carry music, the 2-4. And then a lot of stories, we might do a reel, like, you know, we do that story about the horse dance. So it's like a reel, then it's like... Um, well, he jumped and he jumped and he jumped again and he jumped around the room like a little red hen. He jumped for five feet off the ground. He jumped and he slipped and he jumped around. Well, he jumped, jumped, jumped again and he jumped around the room like a little red hen. He jumped for five feet off the ground. He jumped and he slipped and he jumped around. And suddenly he tripped. And suddenly he slipped. And he landed, bang, into the fire. So it's that. So I kind of find, I, try, I often like, I, a story will often come to me not just in the story, like a plot structure, like a story that you would write, like a short story. I'd love to have a character in my head, you know, and I go, oh, what the fuck is this guy? And it'll be, we have a character about this guy called the Vitamin Thief. And when he stays in someone's house, he steals a few vitamins. He goes, I am the Vitamin Thief and I steal the vitamins. And no one else can give me grief because I only steal the little ones. Yeah, I suppose, like, you know, when I was in my 20s and... um you know, like a lot of Irish people, um, you know, there was there was very little jobs in rural Ireland. I just qualified um, as a music teacher and I was going up to Ballina to work on a project that was um resource music teacher for travellers and refugees. And I was, then that funding got pulled and that job didn't happen. And I'd been working in other jobs in Sligo Leitrim in Manor Hamilton. And but when the work ran out, I went to Australia and, um, you know, it was part of it, like, especially in the Irish community, like you couldn't, not drink and it's it's weird like I hope it's different for young Irish people now but certainly for my generation it was like you know there there, there, there wasn't really a plan b or another option at that time it was just everyone just went to the pub it, and you have to remember this was kind of before like mobile were coming on stream at the time so I remember I had a Nokia and but then I remember being in Australia for a few months without a mobile as well not they weren't like it is now and um so you had to kind of go to the Irish pubs for getting work, you know, lads would be saying, oh, this is furniture moving or there's another job going there. And I got a job working in a wheelie bin factory with a load of other Irish guys. But it was that classic thing of like drinking and going to the pub. And what started to happen was a lot of the Irish pubs were very big, you know, and the Irish music, they didn't have many sessions. There were some great sessions, but um, I just ended up being a mess, you know, and I think it was the heat as well, the dehydration of it, you know, and, you know, like I lost a laptop that I brought down, you know, to go writing. And then I lost the violin in fire. And then I lost my mind, you know. And um, by the end of it, I just remember that feeling of like my brain being burdened. Because if, when I started drinking, it was very hard to refuse drugs, you know. And it was kind of, a, it was like there was mad nights in Sydney where you'd end up leaving some Irish pub at two or three in the morning. And then 
you know, there was this great gay club called the Stonewall, you know, and we'd know some lads that were going in there, you know, so we'd have to try and get in there because it was serving late. Then they'd get thrown out of there around five or six in the morning and we'd end up in some early house, you know, or some 24-hour bar, real shitty dive till seven or eight in the morning, ring in sick for work. And, and it got to the point as well where I was no longer staying in anyone's house. I was just drifting. I wasn't able to 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 stay anywhere. I had no money for for rent, or even know how to get a house or sign a lease. All these things were starting to be beyond me at that stage. And at one point, I was staying on someone's couch. These people from Tipperary, and they moved the couch um, out into the yard. You know, so I was, and I slowly, and then into the park, and it became like that. Then where you just go to the 24-hour bar all night and then sleep on a park bench during the day because, you know, if you didn't organise a place to stay, that was what you had to do. And so that's, you know, you know, becoming homeless is, it's people often wonder how it happens. It's kind of gradual, but it can happen really quickly as well, you know. And what I remember most about being homeless in Australia was all the insects be biting you, you know, the big spiders and all that. You'd wake up on the park bench and you'd just be covered, like, in these bites. That was the worst of it, like. But then... um. I was just looking in one day, you know, after about six months of that, you know, and I would be, I, you know, I'd get into trouble in Sydney and I'd go down to Melbourne, I'd get into trouble in Melbourne, go back to Sydney. And then one time I was getting these free food, the Hare Krishnas were giving free food to the homeless. And I was getting food off the Hare Krishnas and I mustn't, I hadn't eaten in a few days, so I ate way too much of it and I bloated. it. And I was kind of rolling around on the ground and the Hare Krishnas were telling me, you know, like, I go to the temple with them and I was ready for that I knew it was some kind of divine intervention I needed and I knew it was kind of a spiritual trip as well because I was asking myself like was I mentally ill because you know in, in the background of my family there was alcoholism and bipolar and all that so I kind of knew there was something going on and um, you know that I, I, I was I was just in a bad state but then um, the Hare, I was going to go to the Hare Krishna's and shave the head because I just knew that was an out that was to get me out of what I was at and um, then I saw these people, and um, some of them were Irish, and they were um, they were just drinking tea. They had these paper cups, you know. Well, that's toilet paper, but they had these paper cups, and they were like, you know, and they were chatting. And I got to know them, and they were in a program of recovery. And there was different places um, at that time that offered recovery programs, you know. Like there was the Matt Talbot Centre in Sydney, obviously named after Matt Talbot from Dublin, and that. It was a homeless shelter, but outside of that, there was given um, various um, recovery group meetings. So I started to, to kind of click in with people there. There was people from Dublin and Kildare, and I eventually got to meet a few other Irish. I think because I was in that mode where, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of trusted Irish people more than other people, you know. But then once I got to meet people from all over the world, and um, there's a huge recovery network, you know. It's, um, there's, there's all kinds of... Um, systems available in a recovery for people for whatever their problem is you know whether it's gambling drugs alcohol and especially now with the internet you know there's so many programs there but um it's just lucky then you know to meet different people and i just took it one day at a time and then i started surfing a bit and then i went back to melbourne then for another two years and i must say once i quit drinking and drugging i had some of the best best years of my life you know i was cycling around on a bike bike and uh just got healthy and Within a few months then I started getting work as an actor and I was a bit more together to start writing stories. And I started learning Greek music then because in Melbourne it's a big Greek population. And because I was just taking a break from Irish pubs for a while, uh, you know, the, the Melbourne crowd were like, um, you're Greek? And I go, no, but your name Andreas. I go, Andreas, Andreas, Madam Magali Andreas. So I was having all this crack, learning Greek music, Italian music. You know, I was like, you know, learning the kind of the... All that kind of stuff, because my father had played the Greek bazooki and Irish music back in the 70s. So I kind of had an ear for some of the Greek bazooki music. So I just kind of, you know, um, started to kind of reinvent myself then as just someone who could play Greek music, Italian music. I started to learn jazz. And jazz is all about living in the moment. You know, you're right there. You're improvising all the time. And that kind of helped me with recovery as well, because recovery is in the now, in the moment, one day at a time. So. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of how it was. The music was always quite central to it, you know. I'm actually taking a bit of a break, I think, because um, uh, since I moved down here, you know, my family farm, my father left me a, f a few acres, 
in the west of Ireland. So just literally 29th of March, the night before the lockdown, I got a mobile home moved onto the farm. And um, so initially I thought I'd be only self-isolating for a week or two because I'd been working in Spain. So when I came back from Spain, got into the mobile, but it's gone on for, as we all know now, for weeks. And I've just been farming and gardening and I love it, you know. I haven't had to go back to Galway or Dublin once since the lockdown, you know. And um, just been enjoying that because um, I'd worked a lot the last few years. You know, I'd been doing a few shows in the Abbey and I think the last show I did in the Abbey finished in November, there before Christmas. Then I came to Galway, I was with the, the National Irish Language Theatre in Antiviark for the Christmas show. And in the meantime, doing all the gigs with the Lachicos. And before February, January, I was in New Orleans. I was covering that for Kula Car, it's, or a, not Kula Car, Block Car for TG Car. And then I'd been in New York with um, the Dublin Theatre Company. This is Pop Baby. So I'd been kind of, you know, doing a lot of the stateside. I just got a three-year visa for work in New York. And, um, you know, suddenly this happened and I just had to take a break. And I've been really enjoying that break. Like... I mean, I've no electricity here. You know, I've got the generator going for like a charge up the laptop. But, um, you know, I saw all candles. Look, around 10 o'clock, it starts getting dark. So I light a candle or two and I'm reading books. And I'm, um, I've also got a tape recorder and tape player. So I'm listening back to old tapes of sessions and stories that I recorded in the 90s when I was growing up, you know, when I was a teenager. I was into like Nirvana and Led Zeppelin and all that. So that's really nice, you know, getting back to that. And um, just, you know, because sometimes you could start writing something when you're young and finish it when you're a bit older. You know, um, I was listening to the radio one day, Claire FM plays this country music sometimes in the afternoon. And they played, you know, that song, Wagon Wheel, Rock Me Mama Like a Wagon Wheel. And they said Bob Dylan started writing it in the 70s and some other fella finished it in 2003. You know, what? It's like a 18 year gap or 28 year gap or something. So part of me is kind of looking back to um, old stories and old tapes and looking at old books. I also got a guitar and I just put four strings on it, you know, so I can kind of play it like a banjo so you can play it. But also because it's the same tune as a banjo or a fiddle. So with just the four strings, look, I took off the top and the bottom. So I'm kind of playing like... You want to come on down to my farm? <clears throat> oh, honey, I know it's so funny. You gotta get out of the city, it'll be no harm. Won't you come down? Won't you come down? Won't you come down to my farm? Dear Mr. Lachico, I've met your type before. You've said that takes too many as a girl, you've knocked on every door. I see I've done my research and I thank you for your offer, yet I am not that kind of girl who's ready to disgrace herself. Woo! Oh, baby, such harsh words, cut me to the core and really hurt. Will you see I'm not like this? Twenty years ago I was on the piss. So I was a rambling man, cat man do to careless man. So it's that kind of stuff, you know, messing. Like I had a sore shoulder from playing a lot of violin over the years. So I just have these little guitars now and I'd be messing around with them. Just messing like it. Yeah, I've just been really enjoying the lockdown. I've had a great pandemic. You know, everyone else is doing Zoom. This is probably only my third Zoom, I'd say, in the lockdown. I've done like people are like, oh, can you get on Zoom? And I go, oh, I'd have to put petrol in the generator. And you know what? I just couldn't be arsed. Like, what works for me is, you know, when something good comes along and like say you write a song or a story or something, it's good to put that up online if if the time is right. But what works for me is I'm not in a mad rush to get everything up online. You know, at the start of this, people said, oh, it's all gone online, all gone online, all theatres gone online, all music. And I understand that, but yeah, I mean, it's great to do stuff online, but at the same time, I don't put too much pressure to do everything online. You know, at the start of the lockdown, you know, and now that it's gone on for so long, people are like, oh, all theatre is moving online, all music is moving online. And it's hard to imagine, you know, because we were going to play in Sligo sometime, you know, up in Fifth and Teeling, and 
we would have started our first gigs on upstairs in McGarrigal's during the flood. So much that, and I, and I thought, God, what if that? What if I never get to do that again? You know, to go up to towns like Galway and Sligo, or be doing Wheelands, you know, to be doing those things that we love, with a gang of people having to crack, like it's heartbreaking. But I think we just have to try. If if, if it's not going to be allowed, we're going to have to try and get together some other ways, even if that's out in the field, you know. And then we might have to work with the weather. So I don't, I don't think that everything has to go online. I hope that. Things might, some things might have to go the other way. We might have to just start getting together in houses or getting together in someone's field. I'm all about the field now because I'm, I've got a field myself. Um, I think it's great that people are putting so much online, but I haven't been engaging with it that much, you know. Um, so I suppose that, you know, the old story, find out what works for you. And I, I would say to anyone, don't be under pressure to, to keep working online because I know for me, it's not healthy if I'm online too much. But um, you know, find what works for you. And what works for me at the moment is the garden and playing the guitar. You know, I'm not saying, gee, I have to get some good now fiddle story online. No, I'm like planting spuds, got my kale and I'm nibbling. And even when I was in the city, I just had a few plants on the balcony, you know. And um, just, you know, find what works for you and getting out and enjoying it. And don't be under pressure to do everything online. That's, that's what works for me anyway.